The year was 1988. Sega introduced its new 16-bit system, the Genesis, aka the Mega Drive for everybody outside of North America. This thing was on shelves for nine years and sold 30 million units. That's even longer than Star Trek The Next Generation was on the air. Did you know 30 million tuned in to see the finale? Coincidence? Probably. So let's get briefly into the graphics of the system. It had 12-bit color, but don't get me wrong. That's not 12 bits per channel HDR. That's 12 bits total, or 4,000 possible colors. Now these colors get stored in one of four 16 color palettes, where color zero is always treated as fully transparent. So you really only get 15 colors per palette. It had two NTSC resolutions. There was 320 by 224 mode that has the square pixels you might expect. And the PAL equivalent mode to that was 320 by 240. It sounded odd to me, but I double checked. Corrections are welcome. An alternate resolution was available at 256 by 224 with non-square pixels that are wider than they are tall. This mode allows us to use less memory per full screen image. So we're able to fit two full screen images in video RAM at the same time. So I know what you're thinking, 15 colors, 224p. Is this what people call high definition? Yes, yes it is. And all of this was good enough for Sonic. But what about video? Introducing Kinetoscope, a Sega Genesis video player. Hi. I'm Joey Parrish. You may remember me from such video tech talks as Maybe AI is a Codec and Upfish, Making Movies Fart. But today, we're going to dive into the process of building a video player for the Genesis. To start, I had to build an encoder, which is one part Python script and one part FFmpeg, because seriously, what else is there besides FFmpeg? I also had to build a player which is mostly written in C for Sega's M68K processor, but also a little assembly for an audio driver that runs on the Sega's Z80 coprocessor. And I'm leaning heavily on an excellent open source SDK called SGDK. When you're starting from scratch with a new video format, you really have to build these two parts in tandem. Now, to encode a video, you have to split each frame of Rick Astley into eight by eight tiles. These tiles are native to the Sega's video display processor, or VDP. Each tile has a palette number encoded into it, and each pixel is a 4-bit index into that 16-color palette. Using the non-square pixel mode, each frame takes up about 28 kilobytes out of the system's 64K of video RAM. And experimentally, I found that 10 FPS is the most that I can push uncompressed frames from main memory into video RAM. We start dropping frames at 11 frames per second, which is why I am sad to say that ours does not go to 11. Audio playback uses 13 kilohertz 8-bit PCM pushed from the Z80 coprocessor to the Yamaha sound chip using a driver that comes with SGDK. I did not write any assembly myself for this. The 8-bit limit comes from the sound chip, and the 13 kHz sample rate is the native rate of that particular audio driver. To wrap all of this up, I created a format that encodes uh, everything into three-second chunks, which is about one megabyte, and wraps it all up with headers with magic, uh, version number, other metadata. Now, for a detailed look at the file format, you can check the format header in the source code. The video encoding process starts with FFmpeg to extract frames from source. Then we use FFmpeg to break those frames up into scenes so we can optimize for the limited number of colors per frame. If you were to pick an optimal palette per frame, the colors would flicker all the time and it looks awful. So doing so per scene is much better. You break the frames up into scenes and then you say this scene gets this optimal palette for all of the frames that comprise that scene. We're just using FFmpeg standard scene detection. We're not really tuning it very much. And we're also letting FFmpeg pick those colors that are optimal for that sequence of frames. 
Next, FFmpeg also handles the color quantization per scene and dithers each frame to use that limited palette for the scene. Finally, Python script handles the conversion of those dithered palleted frames into the tile format used by the Genesis. Audio encoding also starts with FFmpeg to extract audio samples. Then FFmpeg downmixes it to mono, normalizes the volume, and filters out any frequencies below a certain volume threshold as noise. Experimentally, this just helped with certain source content. This gives a cleaner source going into the next stage, which is a SOX plugin for FFmpeg that performs a low pass filter to remove frequencies above the Nyquist frequency, that's half the sample rate, and then resample and dither to 8-bit audio in a way that avoids the most noticeable aliasing artifacts. I wish I could say it was completely free of those, but when you start with content that's not really made for the system, you get what you get. The final steps of the process are all in Python, where we add chunk headers, a thumbnail image, and overall metadata. The total bandwidth for this format works out to 2.4 megabits per second, regardless of the actual content. So there's no content-aware encoding for this platform. And with that, let's do a quick demo. How about a music video starring everyone's favorite red-headed British pop sensation from the 1980s? So let's get back to the slides. Now, most important thing there was that it plays. However, you may have noticed that was a very short clip on a loop. Why is that? Well, it's mainly because of the address space. What we have is a 293 kilobyte per second video stream and a four megabyte address space on the actual cartridge. If you set aside 110 kilobytes for the player binary, what you're left with is a maximum of 13.6 seconds of actual content. Now, that's not a lot. If you were to listen to 13.6 seconds of, say, Gangnam style, you would get to hear Psy say Gangnam once. That's a 94% reduction in Gangnams. So what can we do? Well, let's talk about the typical cartridge. Your typical cartridge from this era has a ROM chip. That's read-only memory. And it's plugged directly into the data bus and address bus of the Sega through this cartridge slot. Those pretty much plug directly into the CPU. When it boots up, it starts executing whatever instruction is at address zero in this ROM chip. There's really not anything else going on in your typical cartridge. I mean, maybe there's a decoupling capacitor, but that's not important. What if we were to give part of the address space to static RAM and only give a small subset to the ROM? What if we add a second bank of RAM, maybe a microcontroller with Wi-Fi. And then the microcontroller has its own back interface to the static RAM separate from the buses that connect to the Sega. So when one bank of RAM is being read by the Sega, the other is being written to by the microcontroller with data that it's pulled down over the internet and vice versa. In this way, you can create a potentially unlimited stream of video data and audio from the internet. So suddenly, this is a lot more than just an encoder and a player. We have custom hardware. We have firmware that runs on the microcontroller. And I even had to create an emulator so that I could do a lot of uh, testing and development on the software, and also so that everyone at home has a chance to experience this, whether or not they have a Sega Genesis. So, would you like to see it? 
sorry, this is pre-recorded. I, I can't hear you. Look. So this monstrosity is my latest prototype. It's composed of several boards stacked together. The reason being, I knew I was going to make mistakes and I wanted to be able to replace one set of subcomponents uh, at a time as I worked through the design issues in those different boards. So at the base, you have a board you can't see inside the shell, but it contains the edge connector. It also contains a flash chip that holds basically the ROM or the player binary. After that, you have two boards, each of which is one bank of static RAM. The boards are identical except for a jumper that sets what address they respond to. And then on top here, you have a board that hosts the microcontroller. The microcontroller is a Raspberry Pi Pico, so RP2040 chipset with built-in Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi is not always great on this microcontroller. It's good enough for IoT, but can it sustain 2.4 megabits per second? Sometimes, but not always, which is why I have this optional Ethernet adapter that plugs into the board right here. So that's the prototype. These are just a few of the failed prototype boards that I made along the way. And that's the rest of them. It was an expensive process. So the first thing that Kinetoscope does when it boots up is gets onto your network and downloads what I'm calling a catalog file. Now this is just a file at a well-known path on the server that contains the metadata about everything else that's available to stream from this server. That's titles, it's thumbnails, and that allows the ROM to construct a menu where you can browse and decide what you wanna watch. These are all of the things that I have available up on my server which is just a cloud storage bucket. So nothing very interesting or active on the server side. So what should we watch? Um, how about Gangnam Style? One Gangnam. Gangnam style. Two Gangnams. That proves it. Two Gangnams was impossible with 1980s cartridge technology. Well, there's so much more that I would really love to do with this project. But I'm about out of time. Thank you very much for your time and for indulging me thus far. If you'd like to learn more, here are some links. Gangnam Style